in Denmark, Queen Margrethe opened a new road bridge connecting the major islands of Falster and Zeeland via the small island of Borreau. The remains of Nazi war criminal Josef Mengele were exhumed in Brazil. The so-called Angel of Death, who had conducted horrific human experiments during the Second World War, had escaped justice and fled to South America in 1949, where he died and was buried under a pseudonym in 1979. Following leads, the West German government traced him to Brazil and the remains were positively identified. The Brazilian government wished to repatriate the remains to Germany, but surviving family members refused, so the skeleton remains in storage at the Sao Paulo Institute for Forensic Medicine to this day, where it is, suitably enough, used as a teaching aid. Five members of the European Economic Community, France, West Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, met in the small town of Schengen, on the triple border between France, West Germany and Luxembourg, to sign the Schengen Agreement. Since shortly after World War II, the three latter countries had been in an economics and customs union known as the Benelux Union, which had essentially eliminated all border controls between the three. Now the Schengen Agreement extended this arrangement to France and West Germany. The concept of free movement of goods, services and people was part of the original foundations of the EEC, but the members had long been unable to reach a consensus about how to implement it. So the Schengen Agreement was an independent initiative between these five governments. In Japan, animator Hayao Miyazaki formed his own animation studio, Studio Ghibli. A lifelong aviation enthusiast, Miyazaki named the studio after the wartime Italian aircraft, the Caproni CA-309 Ghibli, which in turn was named after a Libyan desert wind, which he hoped would blow through the world of animation. To mark the occasion, a heavily edited version of his 1984 feature, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, was released in the US as Warriors of the Wind. It was turning out to be a vintage year at the cinema, in fact, as the summer blockbuster season got into full swing for the US with the release of The Goonies, Daryl and Cocoon. Following that year would be Pale Rider, St Elmo's Fire, Back to the Future, Red Sonja, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Silverado, The Black Cauldron, National Lampoon's European Vacation, Weird Science, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Teen Wolf, A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Rocky IV, Santa Claus the Movie, Jewel of the Nile, Clue, Legend, Brazil, The Colour Purple, Out of Africa and Police Story. Meanwhile, the F1 teams packed up and headed across the Atlantic to Montreal, where the death three years ago of Gilles Villeneuve seemed to scarcely have lessened enthusiasm for Formula One. At the circuit which now bears his name, Canadian fans without a driver in the race and the city's considerable Italian contingent have become enthusiastic Ferrari fans and were hoping to see the red cars do well here. The Williams team continued with their newly redesigned Honda V6s, which had much better fuel consumption, though were still a bit all or nothing on the power output, and due to the difficulty in telling them apart at speed, had coloured in the number 5 on Mansell's nose red. Other than that, it was more or less as you were as far as the cars were concerned, with teams reluctant to make big changes before a few weeks away from base, though Renault had a second lightweight chassis now for Warwick. With Zach Speed as expected missing the flyaway rounds, there were just 25 cars on the entry list, so as usual there'd be nobody sitting it out on race day unless they failed to set a time at all, and under sunny skies the qualifying sessions got underway. And once again, it was the Lotus cars setting the pace, with the Ferraris not far off to the delight of the crowd. In fact, they might have gone better still if Alboreto hadn't had an oil leak which set his car on fire during Saturday's session, one of a number of fires over the course of the two days. So Elio De Angelis took pole with Ayrton Senna alongside. Alboreto and Johansson were behind them, then Prost and Warwick, another good performance from Bootsen in 7th ahead of Rosberg, PK and Tombe, with Mansell back in 16th after technical issues of his own, and Lauda back in 17th after having to swerve to avoid a beaver on track during his fastest lap. Sura, getting over a bout of the flu, could do no better than 20th in the second Brabham, with the two Tyrrells and the hapless Martini bringing up the rear, the latter nearly 10.5 seconds off the pole time and 3 seconds off the Tyrrell boys. The Montreal circuit was historically hard on fuel consumption, and many were predicting a rather dull economy run, with the farcical end of the San Marino race still fresh in the team's minds. With Fabi starting his Tolman from the pits after an oil leak on the grid, the field formed up and away they went, with De Angelis leading Senna and Alboreto, Warwick getting ahead of Johansson into fourth, then Prost, Rosberg, Tombe and Chiva. Nelson Piquet, by contrast, would play no further part in proceedings, his gearbox breaking at the start and putting him out on lap one. Fabi, meanwhile, didn't get moving out of the pits until lap two, went round once and retired with the turbo failure. Warwick's good start belied his car's evil handling, and he began to clearly hold up Johansson and the rest as the leading three began to pull away. Not for long, though. 
While the cameras were watching DeAngelis and Senna, Warwick had a spin which dropped him to 12th. The top three were already spreading out, with two to three seconds between each of them, and Johansson was rapidly catching up after his delay. The other Renault of Tom Bay, meanwhile, was going much better, getting past both Rosberg and Prost and chasing the second Ferrari. Then, on lap six, it was Senna peeling into the pits with a turbo problem on his brand new engine. The cover came off as he tried to explain the problem, while de Cesaris also came in for a new nose cone, having had a spin and collided with Winkelhock while recovering, which put the German out. To compound his error, Andrea nearly took out De Angelis while he was being lapped as he got back up to speed. Rosberg also pitted, having got past Prost, only to spin, while up front Alboreto was now chasing De Angelis down for the lead, which was 4.5 seconds. Senna's problem turned out to be nothing technical with the turbo itself, but a loose clamp holding it in place. It was fixed and he set off again, five laps down, with a lot to do before the end of the race. Terrific Scrap had developed over 10th place between a recovering Warwick and a charging Lauda, both just behind Patrese's Alfa Romeo. Lauda took the place under braking at the hairpin and set his sights on the green car next. So after 10 laps of the 70, De Angelis led Alboreto by just under 4 seconds, with Johansson another 5 behind his teammate, then Tombe and Prost another 4 seconds back, and Cheever in 6, 9 seconds behind Prost. It only took Alboreto another two laps to catch up with his countrymen, and the pair resumed their duelling from previous races, with Michele trying a few times before finally getting passed into turn one on lap 13 to a roar from the crowd. Having got past, Alboreto seemed happy to turn down the boost a bit to conserve fuel, and De Angelis was able to stay in touch with the Ferrari for a while. Further back, both Mansell and Lauda were making progress from disappointing grid positions, with Nigel now up to 7th and Lauda 9th, while Tombe managed to muscle Martini right off the track while lapping him. Fortunately for Pierluigi, he kept it running and continued. By lap 20, De Angelis was starting to drop back a little from Alboreto, who was now about four seconds behind, and about the same ahead of Johansson. He was starting to have a minor gearbox issue on the Lotus, which was slowing him up. Alboreto nearly came a cropper as he lapped Sura, a moment's uncharacteristic inattention from the Swiss driver saw the Ferrari bounce across the curbs and let De Angelis catch right up again, and gave him a hairy moment before they were both able to get past the Brabham, and Alboreto began pulling away again. Warwick's miserable afternoon concluded on lap 25 when he clouted a barrier and put himself out. Then a couple of laps later, Alio lost the back end and wiped half his ram off on another barrier, spreading debris across the track. The yellow and white warning flags came out for four laps while the marshals cleared the debris. Alio aside, the only victim was the defending world champion. Nicky Lauda severed a coolant line and had to retire with an overheating engine. There were rumours at Montreal that Nicky might be seen in the new Haas Lola car in 1986, which would be officially launched at Detroit next week. Alan Jones was signed up for whatever races they ran in 1985, but their plans beyond that weren't clear. As the race entered its second half, two battles were developing in the top six. Johansson caught De Angelis as the pair approached Sierra to lap him, while Prost, who had driven a pretty anonymous race so far, was now on the tail of Tombe. The Renault's third gear had gone AWOL, and Prost was soon passed, while Johansson was clambering all over the back of the Lotus, who was having his own gearbox woes, but was determined to hang on to the position as long as he could. It was almost a mirror of Elio's battle with Alboreto earlier in the race, and had the same outcome. Johansson went by on the start-finish straight, to another cheer from the crowd as he made it a Ferrari 1-2. So it was Alboreto, Johansson, De Angelis, Prost, Tombe, Mansell on lap 52 of 70, and before long Tombe had slipped out of the top six, with a charging Rosberg overtaking his own teammate, and then both Williamses passing the Renault. Meanwhile, Johansson had the bit between his teeth and had caught right up to his teammate, leading to more cheers as the partisan crowd saw the two red cars running in formation. The question was whether Ferrari would issue team orders to tell Stefan to stay behind Michele. The infamous slow sign went out, and he backed off a little. Behind them, Cheever had been putting up a valiant fight for six with Mansell until his electronics went, he kept running at reduced speed, but was out of contention. In the dying stages of the race, De Angelis lost third place to Prost, and then fourth to Rosberg. In fact, Prost actually caught rapidly up to Johansson, and by the penultimate lap, he was right under the Ferrari's rear wing. Had he judged his charge just right? No, as it turned out, balked ever so slightly by De Cesaris, Prost lost just enough ground to make it impossible. So, Alboreto and Johansson came home to take the prancing horse's first 1-2 finish since 1983 the first in Canada since 1970, and the first ever at Montreal, and putting Alboreto and Ferrari top of their respective standings to boot. Prost crossed the finish line and immediately pulled over out of fuel. Rosberg took a fine fourth after being in the pits and also ran dry on his slowing down lap. De Angelis maintained his 100% point scoring record, 
and Mansell picked up the last point. Jacques Lafitte crossed the line 7th, but was penalised one minute for jumping the start, which dropped him a place. The Ferrari renaissance, after a rather dismal 1984, continued apace as the teams packed up to head for the mean streets of Detroit in just seven days' time.